and welcome to the First Issue Club Podcast. We're your weekly comic book reading club that covers all the best first issues. That's a promise. Mm -hmm. A promise to you, a promise to ourselves, and a promise to the comic book community. Only the best here. Yep. Unless it's not. (laughs) And then we made a whoopsie. Yep, we signed our name in blood. Yep, the first episode, if you uh, haven't heard, go back, first issue uh, of the First Issue Club. Yep, we met a demon. Mm Mm-hmm. At a studio, mm-hmm. KCUR in Kansas City. Yep. And he said, all you got to do, oh, a dab will do you. A dab on the parchment will do you. And we dabbed our finger with his cursed dagger. <laughs> Signed our name in blood on the contract. Have yet to be paid, but our souls have been coist. So I wrote Mick Jagger, but it's my blood. You, you so just double cursed. I, I double cursed myself. Right. So now Mick Jagger is going to haunt me. Legally, it's Mick Jagger, but the paper knows it's your blood. Yeah. And so you get double cursed because Shit. you lied not, on a demonic paper. Not good. He. Well, in any case, we're here to celebrate. It's Pride Month! Pride Month! Our favorite month to celebrate because mm-hmm. it's all about inclusion. And that's what, here at First History Club, we uh, pride ourselves on. That's what we think comics are all about, and comic book fandom should be all about. Mm -hmm. This is one of my favorite things about comic book conventions, was that the first one I went to, it felt like such a safe space. Totally. That I could come here and be the wildest version of myself, and let all the nerdy pieces of me and true pieces of me out, and it felt judgment-free. And then you walk back out onto the cold streets outside of a convention center and immediately someone yells something stupid at you because you're dressed to the nines mm-hmm. or, or in a costume or something. And uh, I always think about inclusivity in comics because I think about those cool creators who are doing awesome things for the industry and telling stories of people who aren't always represented really well and then those um places where we all feel comfortable being ourselves in our truest form and not feeling judged now we all know that that isn't everyone's experience at comic book conventions right which is sad Mm -hmm. and it's something that i i wish everyone had and i know a lot of comic book conventions are trying to do a better job because it's important to so many of the creators and so many of the fans that we have this place that feels safe. Yeah. So I'm here to say, fuck the haters. Fuck the weasels at comic book conventions. Mm -hmm. Keep going. We want to be a cool, safe space uh, where we can talk about comics in a, uh, you know, open and... Open, fun, safe environment. Educational, fun, safe environment and want to invite... Anyone who wants to join our club mm-hmm. into the club to read along with us week to week. Yep. If this is your first episode checking out our show, we do this each and every week. You got a week to read the comics to kind of read along with us. And uh, we just discuss those things and we'll talk with you on social media. And uh, please come along. Yeah. we And we love your input. So talk to us on whatever platform you uh, enjoy perusing whether that be Instagram, Facebook, Twitter or we're not on TikTok and I don't think we will ever be on TikTok cuz we're old guys. That would be up to you. You're the social man, Greg. We're not doing TikTok. If you're talking to anybody on social media, it's me. You're talking to Greg. It's me. <laughs> I am the representation on the social media for better or for worse. You're so, talking yeah, to me. If you get mad at anybody, get mad at Greg. Yeah, leave it, me out of I it. I should just leave my personal email on the First Issue Club. <laughs> Website. I don't want to read any of those yeah. emails. <laughs> All right, we've got a few great books that we're so so excited to talk about that have been on our radar for a while. For a while, Basilisk from Colin Bunn, one of our favorite writers, friend of the show. He's been on a time or two. Uh, nice House on the Lake, DC Black Label comic from James Tinian, the fourth. I said that wrong. I'm sure. No, we, you got it. That's I the fourth. did. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. This is the book that had the heat. It had the heat this week. This creator has the heat. This author can do no wrong right now. So you can't get close to James right now because he is emanating so much heat. Yeah. He'll burn you. 
Yes. He'll burn. You, you can't shake his hand. And it's not because of COVID. It's because he will burn your hand. He's so hot right Turn now. Turn you to cinders. <laughs> and then Crush and Lobo. By Mariko Tamaki. A fan favorite of Another the show. Another favorite. This was an important book, speaking of... Uh, Pride Month. Pride Month. Mm-hmm. That we've got a LGBT uh, creator on this. Yes. And... Crush is an LGBT character. Yep. Lots of representation. And DC's been doing some awesome Pride covers. Mm -hmm. I picked up, I think, three today. And uh, yeah, there was a. I don't know. Good job, DC. There was a good job by you. Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy cover. Mm -hmm. There was um, uh, Crush and Lobo had a great um, LGBTQ variant cover that was amazing. Um, Yeah. So. This is the time of the year I get a little bit pessimistic where big corporations usually change their logos to rainbows yes. and like to say like, hey, we're, you know, we're we're out and proud and right there with you. And we all kind of know that they're just doing this for the moolah, but um, uh-huh. here at First Issue Club, we actually do mean it. <laughs> we're not selling anything. This is free. All this uh, is free. That's true. Our love is I was real. like, how do we, because I was like, all those other places say they really mean it. Yeah, well, we're not fucking singular trying to uh, yeah, get you right. on a new foam plan. Uh-huh. I lose money on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we are hemorrhaging money, <laughs> but we fucking love you so goddamn much. And we just want you to be you, babies. Yes. So um, with before we get into the, the episode episode, yeah. we got some kick-ass news. Some big shakeups that are happening right now. Hit me, baby. So the mysterious and elusive new Donny Cates book has bi- finally been revealed. This is a Marvel book. This is a Marvel book. Yes. He's doing the new Hulk series. Hi, hi, hi. With Ryan Otley, who has done Invincible. Mm. He did uh, Spider-Man for a little bit. Yep. Uh, I am okay with this. This is acceptable news. I, I Honestly, it was a shock. And not in like a, oh my God, kind of way. It was uh-huh. just like a, oh. Huh, Donnie's going to do the Hulk. Okay. I would have mixed feelings about anyone who comes on to the Hulk (laughs) because Al Ewing is kicking that book's ass right now. Yeah. It's so good. What a tough act to follow. Totally. He's (laughs) he's written like a legendary run on this book. Mm -hmm. To me, he's kind of, no pun intended, because the recent book is called Immortal Hulk, but- He's kind of brought the Hulk back to life because the character was just so boring for a while. Yeah. Like, big green brute who hasn't changed much over, like, 60 years. You know what I mean? Well, like, I'm sure when you go to artists at conventions mm-hmm. and they're like, oh, yeah, you want me to do, like, a custom cover or draw in your sketchbook? What character do you want? And you're like, the Hulk. They got to be like, Oh, man. <laughs> Fucking hell. I can't draw muscles that big. That's not fun to draw. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of stupid. I don't know. It's just not... He wasn't an exciting character for so long. And well, this this ish, this run has been so exciting. And I love Donny Cates, but... Yeah. Um, well, and where do you go? Yeah, where do you go? I mean, it, it, he's eventually, f- from Al Ewing's story, he's going to mm-hmm. break through the green door. Yep. And come back into the realm of the other superheroes. Yep. Now what? <laughs> like, do you just go back to fighting crime? Yeah. Does, like, Bruce go back to getting a job of being a scientist? <laughs> like, what? Back to basics, baby. That Marvel does this a lot, where they say back to basics with the character. I've got no preconceived notions of what this story is, but they just did it with Iron Man, where they were like, he's getting rid of a lot of his tech, and he's being mm-hmm. street level, and it's going to make him more relatable and easy to jump into and he's going through something personal yep. and we can study those nuances a little bit more. Um, those things are a necessity every once in a while. Mm-hmm. We mentioned the problem with Batman's utility belt sometimes that if you can do everything and anything and, you know, in the Hulk's case, if he can't die, then what are the repercussions? He can get out of any situation. So we've got to potentially move away from that or resolve that somehow to move on to the next phase and Mm -hmm. keep it interesting. Um, I'm sure Donny Cates can do that. If, if you don't know, he's been writing Venom for a long time, completely re-energized that in my opinion. 
Oh, yeah. He did it with uh, Thor, Silver Surfer Black. Yeah. So many great titles in the cosmic realm. Right. It's going to be interesting to see him on a more street level and grounded um, storytelling. And Venom was a great case study for how he could do a great job with the Hulk because Venom Forever was such a broed out character. Oh, for sure. Who was just like a... Venom. (laughs) Venom. That was my Eminem impression. Why don't you put a little makeup? Uh... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's what I thought of when I thought of Venom for the longest time was like new metal fans mm-hmm. and it was just like That's my favorite character. Yeah. Oh, the black goopy one? That's the <laughs> one I like. He eats people and like you know that if it wasn't censored he'd be saying he, fuck a lot. He'd be saying some swears. <laughs> for a lot of books he wasn't much more than that. He was no. like a murderer that was a jerkwad. And for a long time, Marvel didn't give a shit because we were buying no. them. No. Same with The Punisher. Yeah. And that has zero appeal to me now. Mm-hmm. And Donny Cates famously gave Eddie Brock, who is Venom, a son. And we saw that side of him. And he gave him a more personal relationship with the symbiote in a way that we hadn't seen before. Yeah. Um. Now, the the Hulk has had some nuanced things like that happen with his, like, multiple personalities and some taking care of the others. But, again, I, I kind of trust Donny Cates to do something interesting and more personal with it other than Big Green Brute. Yeah. I, I, I hope it isn't a rehashing of his Venom run. Because Venom and Hulk have their similarities of uh-huh. just, like, you have your human host— yeah, and then the creature that is unleashed when stuff needs to happen or yeah. get beat up when I get mad. Yeah, and so it's just like I wonder how closely they're going to be paralleled, or he's just going to try this new, you know, journey with the Hulk mm-hmm. and Bruce Banner. So it'll be interesting. Like you said, I I trust in Donny Cates. He's already proven himself over and over again with his indie success, yeah, and his Marvel success. And has he written anything for DC? I don't think he has. Not that I know of. So uh, he's the Marvel golden boy, and uh, we'll see if he can keep it up. They're like, stay. Speaking of Venom. Yeah. Do you know who's writing Venom now? No, I assumed it was taking a plenty long hiatus. So there's going to be a free comic book day book coming okay. out, which will eventually lead into a new series. It is co-written by Al Ewing and Rom V. Oh my god. Talk about a fucking one-two punch. Ooh. Yeah. That's hilarious. So Al Ewing They and fucking switch a rude. Are switching places. <laughs> How funny is that? I am I think I'm more hyped for that Venom book than I am for the Donny Cates Hulk. Okay, well, Rom V's attached. Rom V, if you haven't read his indie stuff right now, and his Swamp Thing, he's fucking nailing it. Yeah. Nailing it. A lot of people don't know that name. If you're a comic book fan, the next year you are going to be saying, yeah, anything with his name on it, I am buying. Rom V has the same heat that Donny Cates did when he was yes. getting his toes into Marvel. Yes. Like... Rom V, we've known about Rom V for a while uh-huh. just because of this show. He is just dropping missiles left and right on the comic <laughs> book world. And so he, I'm very excited to see him on this Venom book. Yeah, go back a few episodes. We covered the many deaths of Layla Starr, which was a Rom V book out on Boom, mm-hmm. and just gushed about how much we loved it. Yeah. Pick that book. You can still buy that book. It's it's mm-hmm. not impossible yeah. to find. New issues are, uh, I think number two's already out. Three comes out in a couple weeks. Yeah. It's still good. You can it's catch up with it banger. online if you want to. Ooh, it's good. Get a taste of Rom V. That's very exciting. Yeah. So that, that was kind of Another one which I'm like, what do you do now? I I have no idea. I'm I, Those two I trust completely yeah. to do whatever the fuck you want. Yeah. Well, uh, whatever the fuck you want. Go okay. ahead. I don't give a shit. Do it. I'm ready. Um, so the book that we covered uh, earlier in the year, Silver uh, Coin, yes, has been bumped from mini to a ongoing series. No kidding. Yes. So I it, guess sales were really good. Sales were phenomenal. Okay. Issue great. one's already on like a third or fourth printing. Wow. It is. If you don't know about it, it is a book like a horror anthology book, uh-huh. and the difference is it's keeping the same illustrator. 
throughout the series. That the writers are changing. And the writers are a rotating series. Yeah. So we've already seen... Chip uh, Zdarsky. Chip Zdarsky, Kelly Thompson. Jeff Lemire's writing one coming up. Jeff Lemire. So many others are going to be on this book. Mm -hmm. It is going to be fantastic. Yeah. Ed Brubaker. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh. Oh. (laughs) Oh. A lot of writers we like are doing this. This is going to be geeked out. And we say horror anthology, but Mm -hmm. the first one was more of like a vibey um, I guess Twilight more, Zone yeah, sort of a book. Right on. More like a Twilight Zone kind of. The the second one was more like literally like a Chainsaw Massacre sort of like story. Oh, it was just straight up just like <laughs> 80s uh, thrasher movie. But I, I, yeah, I think it's going to I think me. it's going to exist in that space of Twilight Zone depending on what the writer wants to do with it. And there's a common thread through or a couple common threads. Through each story, you noted a, a raven. Yeah, there's you, a raven or a crow in each book that you pointed out to me that I hadn't noticed before. And then there's the a namesake <laughs> of the of the book, a silver coin, which is a coin that has like an eyeball on it mm-hmm. and some kind of mystic property that yeah. uh, rues the life of whoever holds it. Uh-huh. So that's exciting for me because, and well, for us because we really loved the first two issues. So it's mm-hmm. exciting to see them um, to continue it on past whatever, it was six or 12 that they had initially yeah. set it for. And I'm kind of wondering, as as it goes on, are we going to glean more about the coin, or is it just going to stay, like, surface level, like, here's a fucked up story, the coin was also in it? I don't know. What would you want to see? I I feel like I'd like to have some, like, more rules established. <laughs> I love rules you and You do structure. love rules. I'm the complete opposite. I'm just like, I don't even give a fuck where this coin came from. I just want to see them crazy ass stories. I just have a ton of questions about like what exactly the coin is doing and does it have intentions? Was Is it cursed? Does it's It seems like it's kind of like a monkey's paw thing where it like gives you what you want, but in the most brutal way possible. Yeah. But at what cost? Yeah, that's... That's what the first two comics have been, and I don't know if the third, fourth, fifth are going to be exactly that or not. Yeah. So we'll find out. Get a hold of Image and ask if you can write a prequel for the silver coin. <laughs> Explaining the coin. Yeah. <laughs> that would be... I want to lay down the semantics. I... <laughs> Satan threw this coin in a uh-huh. fountain and made a wish. <laughs> Thus the silver coin was burn- born. I... <laughs> this is why I read comics and don't write. Or anything else with them. Because you just meticulously pulled, pick them apart. Oh, my God. I would be the most annoying guy at an <laughs> office being like, well, this doesn't actually make sense because you've got to correlate it to what happened earlier in this thing. <laughs> Send us Stacey up for coffee again. <laughs> I'm, and I'm not the guy, too, who, like, nitpicks a movie for, like, continuity errors. Sure, yeah. But I just, like, I love when pieces get put together. That's all I'm saying. Well, it's easier to do that in comic book form. Yeah. In a movie, there's that, you know, you give them a little bit of a, a grace period of just like, well, thematically, I guess it makes sense. It doesn't have mm-hmm. to make, you know, sense in reality. But right. in, in a comic book, you have more time to think about it and kind of plot it out and yeah. make everything make sense. So. Hopefully we're planning ahead. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Uh-huh. <laughs> we're not winging it on these comics. And the last bit of news uh, before we get into the episode, uh, Seth Rogen... Mm -hmm. Uh, the famous comedian who's done so many great movies Mm -hmm. made a tweet today that he is writing the new TMNT movie Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles that's what that stands for yeah coming out in 2023 he's I think writing and possibly directing it he loves them because they're green baby well thankfully he doesn't love them because they're teenaged (laughs) Or else he'd have to go the way of James Franco, his yeah, bud. Bye, James. Um, w- thoughts? Concerns? I'm, it'll be tonally fun and funny. Yes. The Michael Bay ones were so weird, I did not like them. They, I don't think that's a hot take. Uh, it's a, no. That's a probably pretty icy cold take. Um Weren't they like aliens? Didn't they make them like aliens or something in the Michael they, Bay movie? They really fucked with the backstory of the turtles and yeah. They, they, I th- there was Dimension X, I know that. And uh-huh. I don't know if like the ooze came from Dimension X or they did or something or other. It, I, I didn't see the second one. I saw the first one 
half-heartedly, to, yeah. to be completely honest. And so I don't really know uh, what the through line was for any of those movies, mm-hmm. and I don't think really Michael Bay did either. He was just there to make stuff explode. I remember reading some criticism of like, okay, you, you make this now, you got to give April O'Neil like some substance. <laughs> <laughs> like she can't just be like bad guy bait, right. in like, <laughs> bad guy bait. In like I love the that new millennium. I just see her tied up like on the train tracks, just like oh, God damn it, yeah. I'm bad guy bait again. Yeah, I didn't like. I said I didn't like these movies, and I, I, they didn't stick with me very well. So I'm, I may be conflating different movies, but my take was they're bad. With Seth Rogen, I'm, I'm sure they're going to be tonally closer to. What I enjoy, Mm -hmm. I think, when I think of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles as an adult, of course, they're like stoners. They're teenagers who are like always hungry, Mm -hmm. eating pizza, living in a sewer that looks like a dorm room. Essentially living the best life. Yeah, right. And so, I well, and like in the tweet, like Seth Rogen... Re- uh, released like it looks like a notebook paper and like uh-huh. some kid making notes and it's like you reading it you can deduce it's Leonardo taking notes like he's in science class oh, okay and so they're and they're, they're actually teenagers <laughs> in this book I don't know if they're like going to school school or like splinters teaching them subjects or uh-huh. whatever and he's just like idly taking notes but I thought that was kind of clever of just like Seth Rogen's like yeah they're actually going to be teenagers. Yes. In this series. Because yeah. every movie, they're, they're like early 20-something. Yeah, they're not teens. Uh, it's kind of, it's weird to say that about turtles. They're just like <laughs> aging them. Like, yeah, they, have kind of, they act like 20-year-old turtles, if I'm being uh. completely honest. So I thought that was fun and, um, uh, uh, and something to look forward to in the year 2023, Year of Our Lord. I'll look out for it. Oh, we, don't worry. When it gets closer, you'll be inundated with trailers I'm and sure other I bullshit. I never thought about the turtles being homeschooled. Essentially, I wonder. You know, I didn't either. <laughs> you think they're like weird evangelicals, <laughs> right? They're like flat earthers. You're telling me the the Earth is curved like my shell on my back. <laughs> you, your mouth to God turtles ears. Mm-hmm. I don't think so, bud. These turtles were at the insurrection. Oh. <laughs> Civil War Two. Let's mm-hmm. do this. Follow the green guys. <laughs> Maga Splinter. <laughs> Make rats great again. Yeah, yeah, yikes. Let's get into our comics. I can barely stand it. First up, Basilisk by Cullen Bunn. Mm-hmm. Jonas Scharf. It is a book about... Uh, an unlikely team up of individuals. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's essentially a team book. Yep. Uh, we don't know how this team. This is like an origin thing. We don't know how the team met. Yeah. Or what really most of the powers of the other individuals are about. More questions than answers. Yes. In this book, for sure. Yep. We get this woman who's hunting down this w- woman named Basilisk, or like that's her code name or whatever. Yeah, right. And who has the power to. Uh, see people to death. <laughs> essentially, yeah. Her eyes yeah. turn blue. The character design is incredible. She has like a blue veil draped halfway down her face. Mm-hmm. Looks awesome. Dope as fuck. And she peels it back, opens her eyes, and burns people to a crisp. It's like when you look into the Ark of the Covenant. Yes. You just kind of like <laughs> melt. And... Yeah. She's not sending like beam heat rays and like burning people. No, it's, it's like, not like Cyclops or it's anything. Like, yeah. You make eye contact with her. Mm-hmm. You're uh, filleted. Yeah. And so um, on the cover A of this book, each of the characters is like in shadowed light. Okay. I, I think we noticed the same thing. And they each have something highlighted. Booyah. Yeah. There's an attribute on their body that's highlighted yep. or um, kind of the light hits it in a different way. Yeah. Like an arm or a leg or like there's a bird. And so each our of main these- character's eyes. Our ma- main character's eyes. Someone's hand. Mm-hmm. Someone's headband, which appears to be made out of flowers. Yep. So I don't know if they control nature or, or something. Or headbands. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hair. <laughs> My power is fashion. <laughs> and then some guy's bird. Yes, controls birds, which we see in the first issue. Mm-hmm. He's got bird spies. 
I would, I would love to have bird spies. You gotta have bird spies. Uh, They're the original drones. Yes, God's drones. <laughs> they run on batteries, which is prayer. <laughs> We're really leaning into the evangelical stuff this episode. <laughs> hey, man, that's just the truth finally coming out. Birds run on God batteries, which is prayer. And so the so the book follows uh, our protagonist, who is a woman mm. who lived through a catastrophic event. Yeah, which is this team, that, and they're dressed in like uh, prison outfits, either prison outfits or like institution, some sort of jumpsuit looking thing. They're all dressed the same, like they, they just escaped out of something. They wander into a town in a daze. And apparently kill a bunch of people. Oh, they fucking wreck it. Yeah. But she points out later that they were like, we were like newborns at that point. We had no clue what we were doing. Were they made in a lab? Were they... It makes sense. Like, they were exper- experimented on. Yeah. And then... And then released or escaped on accident mm-hmm. during during an accident or something. I don't know. But do, I... These are the sort of comics that I like. These, like, slow burn... A little scary, a lot of fantasy, um, poses a ton of questions, and I want to keep reading to like mm-hmm. find out what the deal is. Right? Um, could this book have done a little bit more to make me be like, "Yeah, I need book two. Certainly, it didn't have well. And sometimes I criticize when something's like too much of a slapper of a cliffhanger. <laughs> <laughs> so I, so I, I'm, I may be contradicting myself here, but like, I don't want a book to like blow its wad with a twist on the last page, mm. and then it can like never live up to the cliffhanger. Sure, this book is definitely not in that category. No, uh-uh. but at the same time, it just, it just didn't give me so much to be like, oh yeah, this is the book that blank or this is Mm -hmm. the book where i'm gonna find out x like i can't walk away from it saying that and sometimes i worry that month to month even though this book is gearing up to be something really engaging awesome that people might not hang on to it because they'll say what was that book about again i 100 percent know what you mean yeah and normally Cullen Bunn is pretty withholding on a story in like a good way. Yeah. Like he doesn't give away too much and he knows when to pepper in enough detail to kind of keep you motivated to keep reading. Yeah. Um, this one, I think he was a little too reserved, which is Bone Parish is a book he wrote. Bone Parish. Perfect so I, level. Yeah. I walked away from issue one. Uh, clamoring. S- clamoring for more. G- gasping for more issues of Pre- Bone Parish. Premise. Snort dead people, you hallucinate living their lives. And then you, the hook right there. Oh, my God. It was so good. This one, <laughs> I needed a little bit more hook, but uh, there's there's enough there for me as a Colin Bunn fan. And like I mentioned, kick-ass character design. Oh, yeah. Our lead looks so fucking cool. Yeah. Uh, I'm excited to see what the other characters kind of look like in their doing. costume, mm-hmm. whatever. Okay, Basilisk. 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 It was a quick read, too. I kind of... The quickest read. Realized while I was reading it. If you like buying comics... And being done with them real quick. And putting putting them in your short box and feeling like you accomplished something, you're going to love this. Yeah. Easy to read, lots of art. It was over in a flash. It was over in a flash is right. I... One thing that drives me crazy about a lot of comics lately, especially independents, is like the last six pages are like ads, right? Yeah, what's up with that? And so you hit the end of the story and you're like, that's it? I thought I had like another half of this to go. You can put more story in here if you wanted to, <laughs> Image. So many, Boom does like the worst at this. Yeah, Boom's crazy. Boom does so many ads in the back of their books. So does Aftershock now. And it's just books that are coming out in the next... Like, a couple weeks. Yes. And, like, all the covers you can get. Like, I don't fucking care. That's ads. That's ads for you. That's ads for you. You know what? Ads, they're just, like, billboards and books, man. Mm. Crazy. Do we want to save Nice House on the Lake for last? Yes, we do. Okay. Next up, we're going to get into Crush and Lobo. This one's on DC Comics. Duh. 
You know Lobo. Uh, another kind of unique team up book. Well, kind of. Yeah, you're, you're gonna have uh, Lobo and Crush eventually team up to, yep. I don't know, maybe get Lobo out of intergalactic prison. Yeah. But first, we have to give a peek of what Crush has been up to. Crush is Lobo's uh, biological daughter. Biological daughter who was once a member of Teen Titans mm-hmm. and is no longer. She's out doing her own thing. Uh, she's got herself a girlfriend, yep. and she is doing her best job at fucking that relationship up mm-hmm. as best as she can. <laughs> who, who among us hasn't been in that situation? Oh, overanalyzing every text, mm-hmm. beating yourself up too much about something you could have just said, I'm sorry, and moved on. And the thing is- Teen uh, problems, you know? I, and you're dead on. This book was like a perfect teen book. Mariko Tamaki, fantastic at this sort of thing. Yep. And I mean, Crush is a very different character than I've seen her write for in the past. And she crushed it. (laughs) Pun intended. Did a really good job. If you want to read a fantastic graphic novel Mm -hmm. of teen romance and conflict, she wrote um, Laura Dean. Mm-hmm. Keeps breaking up with me mm-hmm. or something like that. Yep. Oh my God. I loved that book. The style in it was great. The story was fantastic. The writing for the age group seemed so real and just took you to like a really uh, honest place. Yep. It was very reminiscent of your teen feelings. Um, she's fantastic at that. They picked the perfect writer for this. If you also want that kind of story, but set in the DC universe, she also wrote Harley Quinn, Breaking Glass. I never read that. It is phenomenal. Yeah. I'll let you borrow my copy. Okay. It is like, it 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 flips your expectation of who Harley Quinn is mm-hmm. and where she came from in the most delightful way. Great. And it is 100% a must read if you are a Harley Quinn fan yes. and a Mariko Tamaki fan. Mm-hmm. 100%. <laughs> This book kind of has like a narration from Crush as if she knows she's in a comic book or is maybe writing in her journal and mm-hmm. knows that like she's she's writing it to like a theoretical reader. Yeah. Her inner self or whatever. Yeah, or, right. It, it reads a little bit of Deadpoolish, mm-hmm. um, kind of fourth wall breaking, which I'm fine with. We've seen it a ton of times in comic books before. It's not... If you're going to do it with a character, Lobo... Fam- totally. Family of characters is like f- great. Doesn't seem out of place or weird. Mm-hmm. No, I and Lobo is a character that really hasn't gotten much play recently mm-hmm. in the DC universe. He had a little bit of a death metal, death metal, and yeah, all that. He was in there for a little bit. So this will be fun to see him and his daughter interacting. And I I've think- never seen them interact in a comic before. I could have sworn in a Teen Titans It probably line, happened. Yeah, they were just like a one or two thing of just like, oh, you're my real dad. Oh, crazy. And then yeah. different sides of the world. They're the last two that we know of, of their species. Yes, because Lobo killed everyone. They're aliens and he killed everyone. And I don't know if he knew he had a daughter. He didn't. Yeah. I right. think that's what we learned in the Teen Titans uh, book. Yes. And this book did what Reptil wanted to do. With kind of giving you an update of what her backstory is. Oh my god, yes. And it did it. She also didn't have as awful of a back as a backstory as Reptil did. <laughs> if you want I'm to hear sorry. about that, read the last. Listen to the last episode. The last episode was fun, <laughs> and I'll say we had a good time throwing some yucks at that book. But it is on. I want to be clear that like one, it's a team book. Mm-hmm. And we we already mentioned in the episode that we went probably harder on it than we should have because it was for teens and kids. Yeah. But but an, another thing is I just want to say, like, it's nothing on the writer. I don't want to be, like, negative oh, sure. to this writer because they wrote the, – the, the author of Reptil wrote a fun, accessible-ish – comic but they inherited just like the weirdest most convoluted backstory Mm -hmm. and putting to task to like reintroduce that character and explain them in the same book like no 
It's like adopting a dog from a shelter. Yeah. You don't know how the previous owner treated the dog <laughs> and what complexes it gave to that animal. Yeah. And you're just kind of inheriting it when mm-hmm. you adopt it. And you're like, well, I guess I'll just do the, the best I can with this and yeah. go, from in, go from there. Yeah. If you don't know Reptile's deal, his parents were paleontologists and they found like an amulet mm-hmm. that ended up getting sunk into Reptile's chest and let him turn into, like, halfway any dinosaur he wants. Yeah, he has the ability to, like, morph into a dinosaur that he yeah. can conjure up in his mind. Yeah. And so sometimes he just needs a dinosaur tail, so he'll just do his tail. Or sometimes he'll need the, a dinosaur arm, so he'll just do his arm. Like we said, stupid. <laughs> it's like, what do you do with that? Sometimes you just need a dinosaur arm. What can you do? Ugh. Back to Crush and Lobo, a much better comic. A book that is not stupid. Yes. It's actually very good. Yeah, I love the relationship stuff. Yeah. I love Crush's attitude about all of it. Mm-hmm. I love that it puts her in some of her re- relationship turmoil, puts her in a place that's like, what's the point? Who do I fall back on? She's emotionally... um in, in, Closed off. In like, well, she's kind of in like low ground, which leaves her susceptible to being like maybe manipulated doing things that she wouldn't normally do because she's not in a happy place. So it it seemed like more reasonable to me that she would like accept this like insane call from her estranged father who's in prison, mm-hmm. who she like doesn't have a relationship with, like basically wants nothing to do with. And then she's going to, like, steal a plane and fly to outer space jail to, like, meet him. Because in her mind, that's easier to deal with than herself. Yes. And facing uh, her own emotions and and her girlfriend. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And I've been in several relationships where I'm just like, I would rather fly off to space right now than (laughs) deal with this fucking shit. Yeah. And so that was totally relatable to me as a 35 year old man. Like, I, I have been there. I have, I have seen that situation through Lobo's eye or, or Crush's eye. Yes. So I, I instantly knew that situation. Yes. And so that's why I think this is such a great book for teens and, you know, up. Yes. Really. It's like, right. it's just figuring yourself out. And I think hopefully this book, you know, validates the, the, the thinking of you can't be in a healthy relationship if you're not like a complete healthy person. Right. Like, and that's a message that I think a lot of people need to hear. Totally. Is you need to work on yourself before you can even enter into a relationship. Yes. Yeah. So, so many layers to peel in this book that, like, somehow reads is really fun. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, we've got so many serious themes and all these, like, heavy threads, but is also a blast to read. Like, yeah, bravo. So well written. So this book has a lot, of, a lot of great possibilities. Mariko has been on a glorious track record of fantastic books. So mm-hmm. I know this one's going to be another jewel in her crown, and I'm very excited to see where it goes. Hell yes. So <laughs> I am just on pins and needles for this next book. Oh my god, I know. Uh, we ever since this book was announced, nice house on the lake. Um, oddly enough, on DC Comics Black Label. Um, it kind of fits into like the realm of Hill House and those like spooky yeah black label books. This isn't that Hill House. I think is done. It that is was done. Joe Hill's imprint. Yep. It was weird to see this on DC. It seems like it would have been perfect for Image or Boom, where Tinian goes for a lot of his independent books. Sure. Um. I think DC probably saw the success of a lot of James Tenyon's independent things like Something is Killing the Children and was like, hey, you know you can do that here too, right? Yeah, <laughs> and we'll pay you maybe a little bit more if you I want. I know. Um, I didn't see tons of hype for this book. And I expected the stack at my comic book shop – To be like a mile high. I expected this to be something like everyone pre-ordered 
and every shop over-ordered, but it somehow still wasn't. And I don't know if it was like the unassuming cover that maybe didn't grab people. I don't know. It came out the same week as like The Conjuring, which is like, ugh, for some reason, got ordered really high. It's it will because it had some like hypey variant covers. The Conjuring book did. Is that what it was? Yeah, they had like this VHS variant uh-huh. that like made it look like an old VHS tape from like a blockbuster with like fake stickers on it. Cool. Fuck that book. <laughs> the Nice House on the Lake fucking slaps. It was fantastic. It is unbelievably. Good. My expectations for anything this guy writes are so high, and still I'm like. Why do I buy other comics? <laughs> he, he fucking kicked my brain into another dimension with this book. The thought and the detail in the in the lead up to this book yeah. is insane. Yeah. It is so stacked and layered and there's so much fucking shit going on in here. And the fact that he told a story so complex and it wasn't confusing or convoluted yeah. or trite or anything is nothing short of astonishing. It could have been a one-shot. It honestly could have been. This definitely could have been a one-shot. I don't know how many more issues it is. Do you? I don't know. But uh, I know it's more. And <laughs> it, it More than one? It's not, less than 100. Yes, we'll say that. Let's say that. Um, and I don't, I don't know where it goes from here. And that's another, like, great way to end an issue. Mm-hmm from someone you trust is to just like put it in a place where there's like, there's nowhere for this book to go. They wrote themselves into such a hole and then to, well, (laughs) to just like wonder, like when you open the cover of the second issue, like what the hell is it going to be? What are you going to see? Yeah. I have no clue. We haven't talked about any of the specifics of this. There's one part the the ending of it, there's, had, there's had an, one main question that needs to be answered. Well, the ending of it, too, had an aspect that I was like, does this make it l- less mind-blowing? And We'll get to that. I'll pose that question to you once we unpack the book a little more. Okay. Do we want to get into the synopsis or methodology of it? I'll, let me say this. We're following specifically one woman mm-hmm. who describes having... Um, met this man through like a series of circumstances and connections mm-hmm. and they texted a little, went on a date and he's invited her to this like common friends lake house trip. Yes. Um. So far, you're hitting it all. 10 for yeah, 10. It, it's written so well as like, I, I've had these sort of situations in my life where like, friends you haven't seen in a year and a half or so is like, let's get the gang back together and rent a place in the Ozarks and yep. whatever. And, uh, you know, great. It, it, it read so accurately. They even put like the literal email the guy sends everybody in. Oh this. my God. And I was like, this reads just like this uh-huh. situation. He's writing the perfect thriller yeah. right now. Um, yeah, at the whole time, the, one, the cover makes it obvious that it's a thriller, mm-hmm. right? But, Very striking cover. But you have no th- way to in to know where it's going. Mm-hmm. You just know that it's a thriller. Mm-hmm. There's no like real giveaways from the cover art. Um, they end up at this lake house, miraculous house, amazing. And then the way we introduce all the characters is fantastic. I was captivated. It was so good. They all had little bios and synopsises, and each person was like, you know, they're from this group of friends. They're like the college group Mm -hmm. or the New York group. It was very, like, methodical, the way they were, like, categorized. And then they wrap up each, like, little snippet about who they are in a nutshell with... Met uh, like met them twelve years ago. Uh, Decided to invite them. They were selected. Yes. I think it just said selected five years ago or one year ago or you know twelve years ago on that date. 
And so you start to put together as a reader, as all these people are saying like, oh, so-and-so's here at the lake house. Or like, oh, you know, we like met, but like, oh, I've heard about you, but we've never met in person, blah, blah, blah. And as you're reading these synopsises, you're like, okay, this guy curated this specific group of people. Mm -hmm. And he's given them all code names too. Code names, symbols. And symbols, right? So there's like an artist who was our main character Mm -hmm. and... All kinds of different, yeah, like an accountant archetypes of like, yep, people and jobs and things, yep. And I mean, my brain, as I'm sure yours was, was just reeling at this point. We're like so at at this point in the book, you're so attached to the character we've been introduced to at the beginning, and even though we're getting such short amounts of time with the new people introduced. You're like immediately asking questions about them. I'm remembering each of them really well. Mm-hmm. They did such a good job of bringing new people into the fold the way they did. Yep. Um, it was like first issue masterclass. It truly was. This is like if you're doing a comic book reading club and you want to get your friends into a comic, this is like the perfect comic to like hand your friend. A number one, like. Hey, everybody, we're reading The Nice House on the Lake. Yeah, this book just came out. I think you'll like it. This is like a great get-your-buddy-into-comic-books comic comic book. I would 100% agree. It's not superhero-y. It's not so fantastical fantasy that it's going to turn people off who are, like, not into that. Um, Okay, have we gone far enough into lead-up and praise to get into spoilers? I think we have. Okay, so we're going to spoil the book and talk about the ending. If you don't want to hear that... Flip, see you next week. Flip us off. We'll see you next week. Okay, so you're here for spoilers. Well, you're here for spoilers. We've, solid. So we find out that the main character who has cultivated this meeting or planned this whole thing is not human. Yes. We don't know if they're alien, demon, whatever. There's biologically human. Biologically, they are or, something not of human race. Yes. That was the thing that I was like, okay, alien stuff. I, sometimes that hits me every once in a while when it's like, okay, this person's an alien. I, it, he says know, my race. So mm-hmm. I'm assuming, unless it's like mole people from under the like ancient shapeshifters from below the ground. Sure. Uh, it's probably aliens from outer space. It's either aliens because at the beginning of the book, he posed the question to the artist. Oh, I can't believe I didn't mention this. Um, how do you think the world will end? Yes. Essentially. And that's how they that's how they start their relationship or their friendship of just going back and forth of different ways. Movies have done it or books or like. How, she said how, their how, dates would be like watching disaster movies and it was almost like a. Research. A, a research project, the way they'd handle it. And yeah. she always thought there was, like, a charm in this, like... Cute, running gag. In this, like, cute running gag they had about talking about the end of the world. Mm-hmm. So uh, the the top bet here is that it is alien. Yeah. And then during this time when they're introducing one another, she gets service on her cell phone and is on social media. And she sees that, like, every major town in America... It has been like firebombed or yeah. like been attacked with right. some kind of uh, chemical warfare because people are like melting or catching on fire. Like yeah. it, there's devastation. There were everywhere. There was like an entire page of tweets, which was fucking rad. It was it was like one of the first things you see. You see your like her reaction face, mm-hmm. and then you just get like a couple of pages of what she's seeing on social media or on BuzzFeed type sites. And it was such a good way to convey what was happening. Like, so many writers would be like, oh, my God, disaster. Or, like, t- like a little video that's, like, guy reporting and then, like, the sub scroll is say- <laughs> Shit has gone down. Yeah, is, like, saying very literally what has happened. The way we find out about these things now is through, like, tidbits of information on social media that like aren't fully clear yet right and to cascade through like is this a hoax is something really happening man you start to see more and more fucked up shit 
It was such a good way to handle the reveal. Yeah. That the world is essentially actually ending. Yeah. Except for this small little pocket house on the lake that yes. this guy reveals he created for be- them. For them because he had grown attached to them or deemed them worthy yes. to survive the apocalypse. Right. And so he's not even staying at the house. No. He's like he's like, I'll check in on you guys every once in a while. I have business to handle. <laughs> right. I got people to kill, essentially. <laughs> and they they one one of the characters does try to kill him. And yeah. like that was that was crazy to me that those couple scenes where like his body morphs uh-huh. and her hand unmorphs. Like, <laughs> yeah, explodes right in front of her. Yeah. It was such a bizarre scene and so trippy and like it 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 kind of really shook me for a second. I was just like, holy fuck, like yeah. this book is going in different directions that I didn't even know was going to go in. This yeah. this was the ultimate twist for me in for this week's comics. So this this reveal was fantastic. It was so good. And so, I mean, we get, um, in the beginning of the book, we kind of get like the end of the story. Do we not? Where she's like kind of wrapping Band-Aids around her head and putting the mask on of just like, so in the beginning, this is how this all started. Oh, I met you're this right. guy. Yes, you're right. She's in like a post-apocalyptic sort of scene. Uh-huh. And she's talking to someone, but we don't know who she's talking to. Right. I totally forgot about that. So You're we, right. we kind of see where this book is leading. Yeah. And, and even then, like, I was like, I do not fucking care if it gave everything away just now. Like, I want to see yeah. how all of this went down. So essentially, she's going to try to journey out from the lake house, we're assuming. Mm-hmm. Unless, or, or they have already. Inle- unless she's just like out on a hike and they're going back to the lake house. Yeah. And so or, beautifully drawn. And how would she have, like, met a new person? You know what I mean? That's another huge thing. If like everyone's been doomed. Well, didn't they say in the comic book that uh, there was supposed to be fifteen, but only eleven could come? Yes. So maybe as these issues go on, like another person shows up that's just like, oh hey, turns out I could make it, or like I was on my way here because I thought I could make it. Oh, and they somehow got and spared they got, from the apocalypse because they, they were like on their way in to a, the home, in a safe zone or something. Right? Huh? Could be. So. This book is just blowing my medulla oblongata, <laughs> and I am I am here for the entire ride, James, on where you're taking us. Yeah, on this beautiful house on the lake. Everything he's writing right now, I like. Department of Truth is my favorite independent book right now. Right, slowly followed up by Something Is Killing the Children. Yeah, which is written by the same person. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> The stuff he's doing, I mean, Batman Mm -hmm. is my favorite, aside from Immortal Hulk, is my favorite superhero comic right now. Yeah, I would would have to agree. I mean, I I don't know. I don't know how he does it, to be honest. (laughs) She shouldn't be this consistent with telling fantastic stories. Yes. But here we are. Talented SOB. Praising him once again for another fucking banger. Mm -hmm. James, take a goddamn break. Take a sabbatical for like a year. Go on a vacation. No, don't do that. <laughs> Let some of the shit rise to the top and I, then come back and sweep it I up again. I need your comics. I met him at a convention. He was very sweet. Yeah, we met him at uh, C2E2. Oh, I didn't meet him at C2E2. Oh, you didn't? No. That's where I met him. Oh, really? Yeah, I met him at C2E2. Oh, anything else? I think that's it. That's all we got. I think I, don't, I, I have ran out of nice things to say about the house on the lake. I know. Some the funny thing is sometimes when we have a book that we like so much, mm-hmm. it's like the conversation is quick because we're like, it was so good, it read was, it, uh, uh, just read it. But now I'm like anxious because I'm just like, I just want to read the second issue. Same. Like now I'm just like waiting around for the second issue to come. I know. Out. Does it jump ahead in time like five years? Is it like the next Ugh. day where they're trying to like figure out what to do with themselves? Oh, there's so many places it can go, and I love like. Any theoretical I can think of, and and honestly, this is why I kind of hate books that are this good, because now it forces <laughs> me to be fucking patient yeah. and wait for the next <laughs> the next issue to come out. One of the things that I love about having to wait is that there's not much uh, that like binge culture has just oh, sure, permeated sure, 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 life sure. so much. Yeah, yeah, and comics kind of force me into that thing where like I have a thing to look forward to, and it creates this. Like stopgap, where I know people are caught up to me, 
because of the time limitations that have been placed on this thing mm-hmm. that it, it creates water cooler sort of talk, which is a moment that, you know, you don't really get anymore. Uh, Game of Thrones was like one of the last things that it was like, man, did you see that last night? Because oh, other, right. totally. otherwise you're like, you know, so-and-so's on episode six and I'm on episode 10 and mm-hmm. this person's on season three already. Like we're all in different places on streaming things, but um, I like some structure in my life with like a something that's gate kept a little bit because right. I don't know. It's just a antique way to enjoy content. You don't gorge yourself on. Maybe I'm just an old head sentimental for it. You're just old fashioned when it comes to your media. That's me. All right. Appreciate it, everybody. And we'll see you next week for more First Issues. And once again, happy Pride Month from us at First Issue Club. Bye.